Uh, I'll have some questions. We'll all have questions for you after that, but that's a great uh, presentation. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Professor David Sloss. Um, uh, prior to actually entering uh, the legal profession, uh, David served for many years at the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, but uh, since entering the Legal Academy, uh, he's become one of the leading scholars on uh, the treaty power and, uh, at least in my view, the self-execution doctrine in general, which um, he'll be happy to talk with you about. Probably not here, but if you like, he'll, he can talk for hours and hours about self-execution. <laughs> uh, and uh, his latest work is actually a, a, well, broadly a book on international law in the Supreme Court, uh, which I, is forthcoming, an edited volume, forthcoming 2010? Mm, probably 2011. So. <laughs> okay, to, forthcoming uh, 2011. So, uh, Professor D David Sloss. All right, uh, thanks very much. Well, uh, first I want to thank the Federalist Society for inviting me to uh, participate in this panel today. Uh, given the brief time available, I really want to make two points. First, I want to try and persuade you that the United States actually has a vital interest in being able to delegate authority to international institutions. And second, that under our Constitution, obligations that flow from those treaty-based delegations are directly binding on domestic, judicial, and executive officials. So to start, let's consider the likely structure of world politics in 2050, 40 years from now. It's a safe bet that the United States will not exercise the same degree of hegemonic power that we do today. China will be a more powerful state than it is now. We may well witness the rise of states like Russia, India, and Iran as global powers. The writing is on the wall. The era of the United States as the world's preeminent superpower will not last forever. As Chinese military and economic power increase, we will not be able to use American muscle to coerce China to conform its behavior to our wishes. However, if we use our current dominant position to strengthen international institutions, those institutions can exercise meaningful constraints on China and other rising powers. Therefore, I would argue, we have a vital national interest in enhancing the authority of existing international institutions or creating new institutions with the power to induce other states to comply with international norms. Now, as Prof Professor McGinnis has noted, there are certainly downsides to vesting international institutions with greater powers. Any international institution that can pressure China to comply with international rules can also pressure the U.S. to comply with those same rules. By delegating authority to international institutions, we constrain China's freedom of action only insofar as we accept similar constraints on the United States. So to ensure that international delegations promote our national interests, we should focus on two factors. First, we want to ensure that the substantive rules applied by those international institutions are consistent with American values. Second, we need to think carefully about when to grant those institutions weak powers versus strong powers. And when I say strong powers, I'm thinking primarily of the power to issue decisions that bind the United States as a matter of international law. In sum, it is wise to proceed cautiously, but geopolitical forces are leading inexorably to greater delegations of authority. As U.S. economic and military power declines relative to other states, we will have greater incentives to delegate authority to international institutions so that those institutions can impose meaningful constraints on other states. Now, this raises an important question. What are the domestic consequences of joining treaties that grant authority to international institutions to issue decisions that are legally binding on the United States? In posing this question, I'm not asking about an ideal constitution. I'm asking about our existing constitution. And in addressing it, I will assume, and I'm sure this is something we'll come back to later, but I'll assume we're talking about valid treaties. In other words, treaties in which the initial delegation of authority to an international body 
does not violate any constitutional prohibitions. Here, the Supreme Court decision in Medellin deserves to be repudiated because it is fundamentally inconsistent with our existing Constitution. The Constitution specifies that all treaties are the supreme law of the land. This means that all treaty-based legal obligations that bind the United States under international law create domestic legal obligations that bind domestic government officers, unless the treaty is constitutionally non-self-executing. A treaty is constitutionally non-self-executing if and only if it obligates the United States to take steps that lie within Congress's exclusive legislative authority under Article I. Now here I want to mention two particular constitutional provisions. First, the Take Care Clause means that the President and federal executive officers have a constitutional duty to implement treaties. This constitutional duty applies to all treaties that impose binding international legal obligations on the United States except for constitutionally non-self-executing treaties. Therefore, if a treaty obligates the United States to comply with the decision of an international tribunal, the President has a constitutional duty to implement that treaty obligation. In executing that duty, the President must act within the scope of authority granted him under the Constitution and other federal laws. The second key constitutional provision is Article VI, in particular that clause which specifies that judges in every state are bound by treaties. This means that state court judges have a constitutional duty to apply treaties. In every case where state law grants the court jurisdiction, if a treaty provides a specific rule that is binding on the United States and is applicable to a contested issue in that case. In my view, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals violated its constitutional duty when it refused to apply Article 94 of the UN Charter in Medellin. Now, this interpretation I am advocating conforms to the Founders' shared understanding of the Take Care Clause and the Supremacy Clause. Moreover, it was the consensus view that prevailed for almost two centuries. Indeed, the view I am describing was the consensus view of all government officials who participated in debates about the Bricker Amendment in the 1950s. And I can say more about that in Q&A if you want. Of course, Senator Bricker's attempt to amend the Constitution failed. Nevertheless, beginning in the 1960s, Scholars and government officials reinterpreted the Constitution to mean what it would have meant if the Bricker Amendment had passed. Under this post-Bricker view, a treaty that imposes binding obligations on the United States under international law does not necessarily bind domestic government officers as a matter of domestic law. In my view, this post-Bricker attempt to amend the Constitution through creative reinterpretation is illegitimate. The only legitimate way to amend the Constitution is to use the Article V amendment process. Absent a formal constitutional amendment, court should interpret the Constitution in accordance with the consensus view that prevailed from the founding until the 1960s. To reiterate, that consensus view can be summarized as follows. Treaty obligations that bind the United States as a matter of international law create domestic legal obligations that bind all state courts under the Supremacy Clause and federal executive officers under Article II who have the domestic legal authority to implement the treaty. And this rule applies to treaties that obligate the United States to comply with decisions of international tribunals in the same way that applies to other legally binding treaties. So I look forward to a lively discussion here. Thank you very much. Thank you.